Welcome back. This is episode 97 of the Veterinary Business Video Show. This episode made possible with the support of Veterinary Practice Magazine. In today's show, we'll ask what makes us feel good about work and hear some suggestions about managing the people who are managing you. We'll see some advice from the late Steve Jobs about collaboration in the workplace. We'll hear some tips about your number one business tool and I'll offer you my quick business tip for this episode. I'm John Sheridan and this is the show that helps practice owners, managers and clinicians just like you to build your successful practice into a great business. Do you remember Maslow's hierarchy which suggests that people are driven first to fulfill their basic needs for security which includes food, shelter and safety? In the workplace, your veterinary practice for example, your employees would probably include under the security heading their own job security and the value of their individual remuneration. There's plenty of evidence which suggests that if they feel that their job is secure and that their salary is reasonable and fair, money ceases to be a prime motivator. So what is it that motivates us to work? Maybe it's got something to do with blurring the difference between work and leisure. Here's a clip filmed by Ted Global in which behavioural economist Dan Ariely suggests that most of us thrive when we feel we're making constant progress and have a clear sense of purpose. I want to talk a little bit today about labor and work. When we think about how people work, the naive intuition we have is that people are like rats in a maze that all people care about is money. And the moment we give people money, we can direct them to work one way, we can direct them to work another way. This is why we give bonuses to bankers and pay in all kinds of ways. And we really have this incredibly simplistic view of why people work and what the labor market looks like. At the same time, if you think about it, there's all kinds of strange behaviors in the world around us. Think about something like mountaineering and mountain climbing. If you read books of people who climb mountains, difficult mountains, do you think that those books are full of moments of joy and happiness? No, they're full of misery. In fact, it's all about frostbites and difficulty to walk and difficulty of breathing, cold, challenging circumstances. And if people were just trying to be happy, the moment they would get to the top, they would say, this was a terrible mistake, I'll never do it again. Instead, let me sit on a beach somewhere drinking mojitos. But instead, people go down, and after they recover, they go up again. And if you think about mountain climbing as an example, it suggests all kinds of things. It suggests that we care about reaching the end, a peak. It suggests that we care about the fight, about the challenge. It suggests that there's all kinds of other things that motivate us to work or behave in all kinds of ways. And for me personally, I started thinking about this after a student came to visit me. This was a student that was a, one of my students a few years earlier, and he came one day back to campus, and he told me the following story. He said that for more than two weeks, he was working on a PowerPoint presentation. He was working in a big bank, and this was in preparation for a merger and acquisition. And he was working very hard on this presentation. Graphs, tables, information. He stayed late at night every day. And the day before it was due, he sent his PowerPoint presentation to his boss. And his boss wrote him back and said, nice presentation, but the merger is canceled. And the guy was deeply depressed. Now, at the moment when he was working, he was actually quite happy. Every night he was enjoying his work, he was staying late, he was perfecting this PowerPoint presentation. But knowing that nobody would ever watch that made him quite depressed. So I thought, started thinking about how do we experiment with this idea of the fruits of our labor. Now I'd like to take the opportunity of thanking Veterinary Practice Magazine for sponsoring this episode of the Veterinary Business Video Show. Veterinary Practice is a lively, informative, educational monthly news magazine devoted to the issues facing veterinary practices in the United Kingdom. Best of all, it's a really good read for everyone in practice with contributions from many of the leading veterinary writers and columnists in the country. 
there's extensive coverage of all the major veterinary events, whether you're dealing with companion animals, large animals, equines, plus the management and more general events. If you're in practice and not currently receiving a copy, or you have ideas you'd like to write about, then email editor at veterinary-practice.com. You can also read the latest issue and back issues on www.vetsurgeon.org. Now let's take a look outside the box for this episode. Does your practice employ a manager? Of course it does. You may or may not employ somebody who is defined as a manager, but everybody in the practice is responsible for managing some of the practice resources. Maybe the client database or kennels, the equipment or the pharmacy, or any one of the other tangible practice assets. It may be a responsibility for other members of the team, or it may simply be that each employee has to work out how best to manage their relationship with their colleagues at work, and that includes the boss. Here's a clip in which Edward Musio offers some advice about managing the people who are managing you. Hi, I'm Edward Musio, CEO of Group Harmonics, and I'm going to tell you how to manage the people managing you. I think at one time or another, most of us have wished that we were all alone in the workplace. There I am, by myself, no one telling me where to go or what to do. Unfortunately, nobody gets to have this. We all have at least one person, our manager, who is pushing on us, giving us expectations, telling us what they want. Now, if you think about it, you can probably pretty easily think of some other people doing that too. Maybe you have a coworker you're working with. Maybe there's an employee you have that demands a lot of your time. Maybe there's a manager in another department that you're doing some work with. Or maybe you have a superior from somewhere else in the company who's got an interest in what you're doing. Or maybe even a customer with some expectations on you. If this is happening to you, you should know you're not alone. It's very typical. Role set theory tells us that each of us have a group like this of about five to eight people. I've drawn six here that we call our primary role set in the workplace. And our primary role set communicates two things to us. They communicate expectations, that's what they want us to do, and they define rewards and sanctions. That is rewards, what we get if we do what they want us to, and sanctions, or how they punish us or make our lives miserable if we don't do what they want. Now what's interesting about role set theory is that research has shown that our role set can drive greater than 80% of our workplace behavior. That's right, these people are driving the majority of what you do at work. That means they can make your life miserable if they want to. You didn't choose them, but they're there. So what do you do? I like the ICE model, I-C-E. Three things everyone should do with their role set. First, you need to identify who they are. Answer the question, who are those five to eight people in my role set? If you're not sure, look at the people you spend a lot of time with and look at the people who drive you the most crazy. There's a good chance those people are in your role set. Second, you want to connect with them. That means you want to build a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Do a team building, go to a bar, whatever you have to do to begin to learn from them what they do and build a personal relationship. That's because of the third thing you need to explain. You need to begin to teach that person, talk to him or her about what it is you do and the other pressures on you so that he or she learns a lot about you as an overall worker. The reason is you need to be three things with the members of your role set. You need to be predictable, reliable, and responsible. That means when they ask you for something, they know what to expect, predictable. That means they know if you say you'll do something, you do it, that's reliable. And that means they know you're working on their stuff even when they're not looking, that's responsible. This is basically an operational definition of trust. And you need the members of your role set to trust you. Now let's see who's on the video show Soapbox for this episode. Here's someone else with firm views about managing people. This time it's the late Steve Jobs, former chief executive of Apple. One of the keys to Apple is Apple's an incredibly collaborative company. You know how many committees we have at Apple? No. Zero. We have no committees. No committees. We are, a ver we are organized like a startup. One person's in charge of iPhone OS software. One person's in charge of Mac hardware. One person's in charge of iPhone hardware engineering. Another person's in charge of worldwide marketing. Another person's in charge of operations. It's, we're organized like a startup. We're the biggest startup on the planet. And we all meet for three hours once a week and we talk about everything we're doing, the whole business. 
And there's tremendous teamwork at the top of the company, which filters down to tremendous teamwork throughout the company. And teamwork is dependent on trusting the other folks to come through with their part without watching them all the time, but trusting that they're going to come through with their parts. And that's what we do really well. And we're great at figuring out how to divide things up into these great teams that we have and all work on the same thing, touch bases frequently, and bring it all together into a product. We do that really well. And so what I do all day is meet with teams of people and work on ideas and solve problems to make new products, to make new marketing programs, whatever it is. And are people willing to tell you you're wrong? <laughs> yeah. I mean, other than snarky journalists. I mean, people have oh, worked Oh, yeah. No, we have wonderful arguments. And do you win them all? Or? Oh, no. I wish I did. <laughs> no, see, you can't. <laughs> if you want to hire great people and have them stay working for you, you have to let them m make a lot of decisions, and you have, to, you have to be run by ideas, not hierarchy. The best ideas have to win. So, Otherwise, good people don't stay. But you must be more than a facilitator who runs meetings. You obviously contribute your own ideas. I contribute ideas, sure. Well, I, why would I be there if I didn't? Now for my quick business tip for this episode. Effective communication with animal owners is your key to practice success. Unless potential clients are aware of your practice, they won't have the information to contact you or seek your services. As soon as they are aware, they should be able to contact your business quickly, easily, and reliably. So if I were to ask which of your business tools was the most essential to help you communicate with your clients and vice versa, and to help potential clients communicate with you, would you say computer and the internet, or would you say the telephone? Here's a clip in which Amanda Donnelly offers her top telephone tips in practice. It's really easy on a busy day to see the phone as an aggravation and to think of the person on the phone as being less important than those clients that are standing in front of you and you don't want to make that mistake. Think of the phone as a customer service tool. You want to think of the phone as an opportunity to attract new clients, to bond existing clients to your practice, and you also want to think of the phone as an opportunity to make a client happy and you want to strive to help them. So first and foremost, think about the phone as an active process on your part. All too often what I find is that the phone is answered and client service representatives are relatively passive. The caller asks questions, you may respond to their questions, and then you, you hang up the phone and the call is done. Instead of that relatively passive process, think about taking charge of the phone call. So from the moment the person calls, you want to come across as, I'm interested in talking to you on the phone and I am here to help you. So for example, when the caller calls, one of the easiest things that you can do is make a statement early on in the call that you want to help them. So if they ask something, rather than immediately answering, you could say, I would be happy to help you with that. Let me get some more information. Or I'd be happy to explain our services. And then you would go on to explain the services. Another excellent tip is to always have a strong closing. And again, in the closing, it should come across that you are here to help the client. Let's say it is a new client that is calling your practice. Part of having a strong closing is conveying to that client why they should come to your practice and giving them what I call a proud statement. So it might sound something like this. Mrs. Jones, uh, we know that you may be calling several practices and we just want to let you know that we would love the opportunity to care for Chloe. And in fact, you can find some more information on our website, And but I want to let you know that Please don't hesitate to call me if you have any questions that come up and I look forward to hearing from you when you're ready to schedule an appointment. The goal is to convey to the client why they should come in and that you're there to help them. If it's an existing client, it could just be a simple statement such as, boy, we're really looking forward to seeing you and Jake on Saturday. He is such a handsome boy 
and we're really looking forward to seeing how he's doing. Again, the goal is enthusiasm with your voice tone. I'm here to help you. I'm interested in you and take charge of that phone call. So what's my quick business tip? Well, it's this. First, never forget the importance of your practice telephone as one of your key business tools. And second, ensure that every member of your team understands that their number one telephone objective is to win and to retain clients for your veterinary business. Well, that's about it for now. I'm John Sheridan, and this is the Veterinary Business Video Show. See you next time.